Hello and welcome again to our service for the 1st of November. Whether on Facebook, YouTube or on our telephone broadcast service, we're delighted today that you're joining us. Those listening on the telephone may find it helpful to have a hymn book to hand and our hymns today are all from both CH3 and from CH4. And so we turn to the Lord in our worship. The Lord Almighty says, For you who obey me, my saving power will rise on you like the sun and bring healing like the sun's rays. Today, November the 1st, is All Saints' Day, and our first hymn recalls this from CH3, number 534, and from CH4, number 740. For all the saints, who from their labours rest. Turn to the Lord in our prayers. Everlasting God, you come to us in so many ways to brighten and fulfill our lives. You are our sun. Even on the darkest days, you shine on us from behind the clouds, giving us warmth and light. You are our guide on our pilgrimage through life. When we feel lost, bewildered, afraid, you show us the way ahead. You are our shield as we face the wounds that life inflicts. As we battle with wrong and pain and despair, you protect our hearts and lives. You are our lifeline. When we can find no sure footing, When the water is deep and cold, we cling tight to you and are pulled safe. We have sometimes chosen the darkness and wandered without a guide. We have ignored your protection and cast you aside. We have not sought your strength, but you offer yourself to us anyway. We admit our wrong, we are sorry, and receive your forgiveness, knowing that it is your gift and not our right. So God, Son and Guide, Shield and Lifeline, Protector and Saviour, we give you our thanks and praise through Jesus Christ our Lord, 
who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory for ever. Amen. For many years, Miss Janet Small was a dedicated elder here in the church at Freecombe. The pulpit fall that you see before you today was made and prepared by Mrs. Christine Moody at the request of the Guild, of which Janet was a faithful and devoted member for many years. Christine says this, she says, I feel privileged to have had the opportunity to design and to make your new pulpit fall. I hope that it will be meaningful to everyone. The Star of Bethlehem symbolises Jesus' birth, and he is recognised as the Messiah. The stars bring light into our darkness. The dove in the centre symbolises the risen Christ and God's loving spirit with us, always, wherever we are. The cross has a circle, like many Celtic crosses, symbolising eternal life. It also has a Celtic or Pictish interwoven design as used on the ancient standing stones when Christianity first arrived in Scotland. A continuous symbol with no end, symbolising Jesus' promise of eternal life for us. People are the church. Jesus has promised to be with us wherever two or three are gathered in his name. The fruits and flowers are a small representation of God's provision for our every need. Christine says that she hopes that this brings an uplifting and positive message at this very difficult time and expresses her love. It is today then with joy and in the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ that I dedicate this pulpit fall to the glory of God and in memory of his servant Janet Small and declare it to be set apart for use in this place, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Blessed God, you caused all Holy Scriptures to be written for our learning, that by patience and by the comfort of your word, we might embrace and forever hold fast the hope of everlasting life. Set your blessing upon this pulpit fall. Bring to life the word proclaimed here by the power of Christ who reveals your loving nature, calls your people to holiness, and offers them new life in the gospel of his grace, even Jesus Christ, the word of life himself, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. And so, God of love and power, you who hold all souls in life and bind together all your people in heaven and on earth in one holy fellowship of service and love. So we praise you for those who in their generation have been lights in the world, in whose lives we have seen the reflections of your goodness and love. We thank you for all that was pure and true, beautiful and good, in Janet's life, commemorated today, and for the grace you gave her of thoughtful generosity, for the example she has left of faith and hope and duty, and of love for your church, and for the assurance we have through Christ that she has entered into glory through the same Jesus Christ our Lord. Living God, fill us with the faith of the gospel that we may be strong to walk in the ways of Christ, eager to listen for his voice and ready to respond to his spirit, so that our lives themselves may also be good news, showing everyone who meets us the story of your matchless love in Christ. 
for his name's sake. Amen. Let us pray. Lift us up to contemplate your word of challenge and love, dear Lord. Bless my words and our thoughts, we pray. Amen. Many of you will know that at the beginning of September, two months ago today, Rona lost her father. During these past two months then, we've been gradually cleaning out the house. And one day soon, probably in the next few days, we shall face that poignant last visit to her father's house, where so many memories have been made over the years. Some of you, I'm sure, will have had the same experience. Leaving behind bricks and mortar, wood and stone, can be a transitional moment with an abiding emotional impact. And the reason I'm telling you this is because our reading today from Matthew's Gospel bears similar significance. It's Holy Week. Jesus has spent the previous few days teaching in the temple in Jerusalem, and he has made something of an impact. In today's reading, Jesus leaves the temple, his father's house, for the last time. He's in conversation with his disciples as he leaves for the Mount of Olives, where he teaches them again in a discourse that's remarkable in tone and content. Sometimes called the Olivet Discourse, it's also known as the Little Apocalypse because of some of the warnings Jesus gives. The reading this morning is taken from the Gospel according to St Matthew, at chapter 24, reading from verse 1, to 14. Jesus left and was going away from the temple when his disciples came to him to call his attention to its buildings. Yes, he said, you may well look at all these. I tell you this, not a single stone here will be left in its place. Every one of them will be thrown down. As Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him in private. Tell us when all this will be, they asked, and what will happen to show that it is the time for your coming and the end of the age? Jesus answered, Be on your guard and do not let anyone deceive you. Many men claiming to speak for me will come and say, I am the Messiah and they will deceive many people. You are going to hear the noise of battles close by and the news of battles far away, but do not be troubled. Such things must happen, but they do not mean that the end has come. Countries will fight each other. Kingdoms will attack one another. There will be famines and earthquakes everywhere. All these things are like the first pains of childbirth. Then you will be arrested and handed over to be punished and be put to death. All mankind will hate you because of me. Many will give up their faith at that time. They will betray one another and hate one another. Then many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Such will be the spread of evil that many people's love will grow cold but whoever holds out to the end will be saved and this good news about the kingdom will be preached through all the world for a witness to all mankind and then the end will come here endeth the reading it is as jesus and his disciples are leaving the temple for the last time at least it was the last time for jesus that the Lord makes comment about the future of the building. No building lasts forever, of course, but the future of this particular building is going to be short. Now, this would be distressing for Jews to hear. They understood the temple as being the symbolic place where heaven and earth meet, the place where God dwells and from where he shall establish his peace going out into all the world through his people. 
So to the Jews, this building is more than simply a magnificent pile of stones. Just as today, church buildings for many provide a symbol of God's ongoing presence, a symbol of the Christian faith, sometimes ongoing through centuries. And in the midst of a shifting world, they give a comforting sense of permanence. And of course, over the years, our buildings will build particular resonance for people both as places of worship and places of memory, from weddings and baptisms to celebrations and to funerals. And the truth is, we would fear to lose them. And we ourselves may dread the day when we can be in the Father's house no longer. Such feelings are hardly new. For the Jews felt exactly the same, and probably much more deeply. Certainly about Jerusalem and its temple. The temple to the Jews represented all that was precious in their faith. Even Jesus' disciples wanted him to admire it. And yet, Jesus had very hard things to say about the places where they were looking for their permanent values. And there was to be a nasty shock. Within a few decades, the building itself was destroyed by the Romans. But here, Jesus was speaking not so much about the temple, but rather about the end of the religious system as they knew it. The coming years would see false messiah figures asking for recruits. It would see wars, natural disasters, disease, fearful events of all kinds, persecution of anyone daring to call themselves a Christian. And such things might have been enough to make waverers despair of God being present at all, as all the world around them shifted and broke up and pulled apart and fear overtook their comfortable stability. Well, so proud and cosy was Jewish culture with their temple worship that they couldn't even read the signs of the times. They couldn't see the injustice that was all around them and the challenges that were coming towards them. It isn't very different for us. Political and religious movements promise the world from false messiahs. Terrorism, cancer and Covid expose wars and pestilence. In a throwaway world, everything is temporary and disposable. We replace our clothes and our electrical items without mending them and without a thought and pollution and climate change follow. Even our values change according to the fashion of the day. These are all signs of a society confused about what really matters and what will give us the best in life. Well, in response, some will close their minds to coming change. Others may find the uncertainty enough to invite despair of God and his world. And the problem is that we generally tend to have one of these two reactions either complacent relaxation, certain that we're all right, or else horror at what the world is coming to. Jesus says that we should have neither. For Jesus wasn't speaking about the end of the temple in itself, just the temple of stone. Rather, Jesus was pointing again to himself as the new temple in which God dwelt, and through whom, God would establish his peace with his people. And through him, through Jesus, and the promise of the Spirit, so God's people would become that new temple going out into all the world. The only place that we can put our hope, rest our lives, find good news, secure our trust, the only source of permanent hope which will not be destroyed is in God himself who dwells with us and in us. Jesus says that when even relatives and friends betray and love grows cold, we need not despair for our security is found in him alone. So don't close your eyes to the future, but don't live in fear of it either. 
It may be that we can find symbols of permanence in our own day. And it may be that we will seek to rest upon them, resting our cosy laurels, our traditions and our history, refusing to change, fearful that change will rock our very foundations forever. Or we may chase after every passing fancy, hopeful that this or that is the answer. But where do we find our salvation but from the Lord alone? The perfect temple of God's presence, who brings true peace and establishes a kingdom of grace for all. We recall that once, nearly 2,000 years ago, a temple was torn down and then built up once again three days later. We recall that in Christ Jesus we have a God who came to us in our moment of need and who now unites us in him with eternity of God. We recall that we share God's renewal and forgiveness and that nothing can separate us from the hope and faith we have in his life-giving grace. For it is in God alone that we will find the values that really last, as with all the saints, we ourselves, by the Spirit, become our Father's house. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our second hymn is from CH3, number 443, and from CH4, number 535. Who would true valor see? Almighty Father, we give you our thanks because you have chosen us to be your people and you have called us together to be your church. We thank you for the love and support we find among your people. We thank you that we are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses, a temple of your presence, and supported by a history and a sense of belonging to a community and a place. We thank you both for the provisions of your hand, for food and clothing, for warmth and home. More so, we thank you that our true home is in the calling and adoption by which you join us as one in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom by faith we are forgiven. Father, the seriousness of your word urges us to be attentive to the goal you are setting your church today, that we may work without weariness, neither overly bound to the past, nor distracted by the deceit of easy peace. Cleanse and purify your people from the heart until we have the vulnerability and openness of children and the brokenness of a holy nation. 
Father, the wars and destructive conflicts of our own age bring home to us the tragic consequences of living by greed and ambition, bitterness and revenge. Heal whatever emotional damage causes complex hostility and teach us to live in peace together. We are distressed by so many young lives broken and distorted by abuse and neglect and the heartbreak of families split apart by emotional conflict and financial worry. Strengthen our families and keep them safe, protecting children from long-term damage. And we long for the injustices of global poverty and famine to be righted, and the suffering spared, for children the world over to have clean water to drink, and for effective cures to be available. Father, as many die through hunger, mismanagement of resources and unfair sharing, so we pray for the victims and ask you to gather them into the light and peace of heaven. And so, Father, we ask your blessing and peace upon those who grieve and those who will see their loved ones no longer. Loving Father, so much is entrusted to us May we act responsibly and take notice of your calling, through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. And our final hymn today from CH3 number 420 and from CH4 number 739. The Church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, her Lord. and in the power of the Spirit, confident in God's mercy and love, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you this day, and remain with you forever.